So, hey guys, my name's Rabani. Um, if you don't know me, I'm one of the PGY1s. Um, and today I'll be talking to you guys about conscious sedation medications. Um, this is something that we do a lot in the ED, so I figured it would be a good review topic. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank the EKG and Visual Diagnosis Lecture Series team for helping me with this presentation. So let's get started. So today the objectives are, I'm gonna be talking to you about dosing, um, the basic pharmacodynamics of the medications, the pros and cons of these medications, and just a, like a, a short thing about like what to monitor and what to look out for. So the big four, we're gonna be talking about propofol, ketamine, ketofol, and atomidate. Um, to start with, um, I put all of these here and there's like a lot of words on this, but I just wanted to put them all here so you knew what the dosings were. But the way that I've used to remember the medications um, is that propofol and ketamine have a similar dosing. Um, their ranges are a little different, but if you can just remember one mg per keg as their loading dose, um, and then 0.5 mg per keg as their PRN um, doses afterwards, you'll be golden. Um, ketofol is like a combination of propofol and ketamine. And so since it's a combo drug, you just take each medication's loading dose and divide it by two. So you get, you split it in half. So that's 0.5 mg per keg of each medication, um, followed by additional PRN doses um, of propofol at 0.5 mg per keg. Um, and then Atomidate um, is just like the last one. It, you can just remember 0.1 mg per keg. So I wanted to talk about propofol first. So like I said, uh, 0.1 mg per keg um, is the loading dose and then subsequent doses are 0.5. Um, the pros and cons of it. So the pros is that it's a short acting sedative medication. Um, it's onset is pretty immediate um, and it's really easy to dose. Um, and the benefits also include that it has decreased muscle tone. So if you're doing an orthopedic procedure, like um, you're doing a reduction, um, this could be a really helpful medication for you, especially like those shoulders that get so tight. Um, having a decreased muscle tone is really helpful. However, um, the cons include that there's no analgesia effect. Um, there's a lot of patients complain of pain on injection. It can cause hypotension and respiratory depression. So to work around the analgesia aspect of it, um, you can pretreat with an opioid. Typically, we use fentanyl um, or ketamine. Um, this can help with any pain related to the procedure. Um, you always have to remember when you're pretreating or treating with opioids, there's a greater risk of respiratory depression. So you want to make sure you have naloxone ready to go. Um, and the workaround for the pain with injections, I was actually curious why that happens. Um, and it's what I found in my reading is that um, propofol is actually an irritant to the vein's endothelium lining. So that's what causes the early amounts of pain. Um, and then there's delayed pain that's due to um, release, of, um, uh, release of mediators like kininogen um, from the kinin cascade. So just that's how they get pain. Um, the ways that you can work around this is you can use larger veins. So by using an AC vein, which is like a vein with a larger diameter, you're able to, um, when you inject the propofol, you inject midstream. And so there's less interaction of the medication with the endothelial wall lining. Additionally, in larger veins, there's more blood. So there's more blood to mix with the propofol and act as a buffer to cause less irritation. Another thing you can do is also use intravenous um, lidocaine. Um, to, you can either inject it prior um, to uh, injecting the propofol by like occluding the vessel um, upstream and then in injecting the lidocaine and then followed by the propofol. Or you can even mix the lidocaine in with the propofol. Um, usually they say it's like 0.5 mix per keg or about three or four cc's of 1% lidocaine can help you do that. Um, another side effect is hypotension. So this is usually due to myocardial depression, primarily because of decreased contractility, um, uh, systemic venous uh, resistance and MAP. Um, there's really minimal effects on the heart rate with this. Um, and then you can also have respiratory depression. And that's why you have to watch out even more so with this medication if you're pre-treating with fentanyl, because that also causes respiratory depression. Um, special considerations for this medication in terms of special populations. Um, it's found that uh, the elderly can have higher plasma levels of this medication. So you might want to consider decreasing the dose by 20%. Uh, additionally, patients um, who have uh, dealing with obesity, you might want to use a lean weight calculator rather than their actual weight. Um, and I found that it's uh, actually interesting. You don't have to renally or hepatically dose it if patients have um, impairments. 
Um, next, ketamine. So ketamine is great because it's a sedative, a dissociative sedative. It has minimal respiratory depression. It also provides you analgesia and it protects your um, spontaneous breathing and your airway reflexes. And it doesn't have the hypotension that you would find with propofol. Um, the cons though, it has a quite a bit of um, side effects including emergence reactions or post-sedation agitation. This can happen in about 20% of patients. Laryngospasm. Um, nausea, vomiting, hypersalvation, tachycardia, hypertension. It can also increase ICP and IOP. So the main, the biggest contraindications to using this medication are uh, patients who are less than three months old. Um, they usually, it's due to their, actually due to their airway anatomy, um, and they can have increased risk of airway obstruction, laryngospasm, and apnea. So you don't want to use it on a patient less than three months of age. Um, you also want to avoid it in patients with psychosis and psychotic disorders. Um, they can actually worsen schizophrenia. Um, and the next, I want to talk about our um, relative contraindication. So um, if you have a patient who's go undergoing a procedure with like increased laryngeal um, stimulation, or you're going to be um, stimulating the upper airway, you might want to avoid it. Um, also patients who have anatomical abnormalities like tracheal stenosis or tracheal malacia, you also probably wouldn't want to use ketamine for that. Um, also patients who have um, systemic cardiovascular diseases, including angina, heart failure, uh, hypertension, um, and that's because um, ketamine has uh, sympathomimetic properties, um, so that uh, there's like a risk of exacerbating these conditions. Um, also, if patients have um, central nervous system masses, hydrocephalus, or other abnormalities, um, because of the um, risk of increased intracranial pressure, um, you want to avoid it. Um, especially in patients who have like a concern for a brain bleed. Um, and then because of the risk of increased intraocular pressure, um, you wanna avoid it in patients with glaucoma or um, patients with globe injury. Um, so back to the side effects and what you can do about them. So emergence reactions. So this is the most common side effect and it can vary in intensity. Um, when I was reading it was that you can avoid, uh, you can try to like mitigate this by um, treating them with midazolam. Uh, you can do that at a 0.05 mg per kg um, immediately prior to the ketamine um, and that can reduce the rate of emergence reactions. But because you are using midazolam, you have to um, be aware of the respiratory depression that can occur. Um, in terms of laryngospasm, so that's higher. That's a higher risk in those patients who have um, anatomical airway abnormalities, like I mentioned earlier, like tracheal stenosis or tracheal malacia. Um, in, if you do notice that this happens, you have make sure that you have your um, airway equipment ready. You're ready to bag them um, because they won't be able to protect their airway and take meaningful breaths. Um, all right. So ketofol. So ketofol is kind of like this like mad scientist that combined both medications, but they actually work really well. Um, when you combine these medications, they act synergistically and you can actually use lower doses of both medications and theoretically decrease the risk of the side effects. Um, and do, by doing this, you decrease the risk of the respiratory depression, the bradycardia, the hypotension that you had with just propofol, and you can decrease the risk of the emergence reactions and the nausea and vomiting of using ketamine alone. But unfortunately, because you are using now two medications instead of one, you've increased well, and you're going to be dealing with the side effects of both. But theoretically, by using a lower dose, you're going to limit your risk of these side effects happening. Um, for anyone who did Sketchy Farm back in the day, this is a little throwback. There's, this is their Sketchy from it. But um, I'm going to talk about Atomidate next. So Atomidate is really great. It's easy to dose. Um, it has very minimal hemodynamic effects, and it can maintain your cardiovascular stability. Um, the cons with this medication, though, are that it doesn't provide analgesia, so the same problem we ran into with propofol. Um, it can have increased risk of myoclonus, so about 80% of patients have that. Um, it can cause respiratory depression nausea, vomiting. Um, there's also pain with injection of this medication. Um, and then a theoretical risk of adrenal insufficiency, um, more so with like continuous infusion, uh, which we won't really run into too often in the ED, but I just thought I'd mention it. Um, so to work around the no analgesia, back to our handy dandy fentanyl or any other opioid, but we gotta worry about the respiratory depression. Um, in terms of the myoclonus, that actually happens because of a subcortical disinhibition. Um, severe myoclonus can be treated with one to two milligrams of IV midazolam every minute until it's resolved. Um, so if you were trying to reduce that shoulder and you decided not to use propofol and use Atomidate, that may not be the best move. Um, usually we don't recommend it for patients who you're doing orthopedic procedures on because of the myoclonus and it would make it a lot more difficult. And with, these, um, with this medication, you do have to adjust um, renally and hepatic, based on their renal and hepatic function. 
So um, I found this chart actually in an anesthesia journal. I thought it was just a nice quick review of the, um, like the hemodynamic um, side effects of these medications. Um, just briefly, I want you to remember propofol brings everything down. So it brings down your contractility. It brings down your um, SVR and your MAP. Um, and then ketamine, it brings everything up. So heart rate goes up, contractility goes up, SVR goes up, so on and so forth. And then automate is kind of like this more neutral. It doesn't really have an effect. It's just kind of like, it keeps everything consistent. Um, so second line medications, um, the way I want you guys to remember these and the uses of these is more so when they're used as adjuncts. For the most part, you're not gonna use them as your primary sedative medication, but you'd use them for their you know, adjunct effects. So midazolam is really great for providing anxiolysis. Um, fentanyl, like I've mentioned already, can provide analgesia, but to remember that you need to, you should have a naloxone ready because of the risk of respiratory depression. Um, Presidex is another great medication. It can preserve your muscle tone and respirations. However, it's not the most predictable medication. It onset is not really predictable, and then it is much longer acting, so it's not as beneficial for us in the ED. Um, and then nitrous oxide is like a really nice triple threat kind of medication. Um, it can provide analgesia, anxiolysis, and sedation. But um, I was asking around it, we really don't have uh, access to that medication in the ED. Um, I know they use it a lot in the dentist's offices. Um, so maybe that could be a nice thing to have. But like I said, we don't really have access to it right now. So that's kind of one of the cons for it. So in terms of monitoring, I wanted to bring up just monitoring with end tidal CO2. Um, it's a really great way of just monitoring how much um, like car carbon dioxide is exhaled in each breath. And it's a really great way of um, monitoring ventilation status um, in these patients. So um, I have a couple of waveforms out here that you get just to look out for. Um, can someone from the audience tell me what they think um, is going on in the top waveform? I can't quite see the chat, so I don't know if anyone's putting it in the chat. Uh, the top one looks like the shark uh, shark fin, is that correct? Or the second one? Uh, well, so yeah, in the top one, what's happening is that um, the patient is um, bradypneic and they're not, they're, not ventilating as well um, because of their decreased respiratory rate. So they have like a good tidal volume, um, but because of their low respiratory rate, um, their end tidal CO2 is much um, greater, is increased. Um, so what you'll see in this is a, a tall and a really wide curve. Um, and this is a form of hypoventilation that happens commonly with patients with opioid overdose. Um, the second one, does anyone have any idea? The second one's also another example of hypoventilation, but in this case, um, the patient might have somewhat normal to maybe a little bit slowed respiratory rate, um, but they're not having a good tidal volume, so they're kind of taking more shallower breaths. Um, so not as much CO2 is getting to the sensor, um, so that's going to show up as a decreased end tidal CO2. So the curve is um, more narrow and also the amplitude is lower. Um, does someone want to tell me what's going on in the top one? That's like big scaries. Apnea. Yeah, exactly. So apnea, or it can even be um, what you see in like a patient with complete laryngospasm. Um, this is really bad. Obviously, no CO2 is getting to the sensor, so there's just no more wave waveforms. This is really bad if you see this. Uh, get your airway stuff ready, get um, your bagging, and start bagging the patient. Um, if you're also, if you're looking for a patient with like complete laryngospasm, you might see some chest wall movement. You won't hear breath sounds on auscultation. Uh, you won't hear strider or upper airway sounds. Um, a patient, the second one is what can happen with a patient with partial laryngospasm. You might have like a more normal looking um, end tidal CO2 waveform, um, but you'll hear the noisy breathing, um, which might tip you off that that's what's going on. Um, so key takeaways for this lecture, um, propofol is really fast on and fast off, but it doesn't give you analgesia. Ketamine can do both while preserving your airway, um, but it has a lot of side effects. 
Ketofol can mitigate the side effects, but you end up and you can use half the dosage of each medication. Um, you always want to look at your end tidal CO2 for respiratory failure because that's part of the ABCs. Um, and then if you're giving fentanyl, make sure you have naloxone at the ready. Um, these are my references if anyone has any questions. Very nice, Rubani. Good job. Good job, Rubani. A few comments that you can still get apnea when you're using Ketofol. I've had it a few times and I've given up using it. And uh, fentanyl is a great drug for like procedures, but it doesn't last very long. So don't give it to your trauma patients for pain med unless you're going to do a painful procedure. Give them something longer acted unless you're going to use a fentanyl drip. Um. Just comment. I mean, entitled CO2, it's, uh, we have it. It's uh, kind of standard. It's not, not necessarily standard of care for sedation everywhere, so you might not have it. So just uh, keep that in mind. You're going to have to uh, keep an eye on ventilation if you don't have that. And something to think about is if uh, you're doing moderate sedation and you're only using pulse socks, um, having, giving supplementary oxygen, oxygen can delay uh, identifying uh, hypoxia. So just you don't have to put everyone on oxygen if you're doing sedation. Um, just a comment on Dr. Silverberg's uh, the fentanyl. I like giving fentanyl up front in an undifferentiated uh, trauma patient, but he's right, it's it's short acting. So uh, I, I like that fact before I know if they're going to be have a significant injury, but you do have to follow it up with a longer acting uh, after initial evaluation. 